In the middle years of World War II, on a dark night over the European theater of war, a formation of B-17 bombers was making its way to its target. Bombing at night was considered to be safer, if anything in war can be considered safe at all, than day bombing was, perhaps for obvious reasons. Slow, lumbering B-17 bombers, at least slow relative to the fighter planes that the Nazis used at the time, uh, didn't seem like a very good idea. And indeed, it was a fairly short-lived experiment. They moved to night bombing in the hopes that they would be able to improve their effectiveness. On one of the B-17s, there was a young crew member somewhat comforted by being at night on this run, but nervous nonetheless. As they approached their target, descending perhaps through 4,000 feet or so, the last thing a B-17 crew wants to see was very clearly seen. The cockpit was lit up. And then the wings were lit up, not from within the plane, but from without. Apparently, the Nazis had determined ahead of time that this just might be an approach path for this particular target. And they had spotlights, powerful spotlights that were set up right next to very substantial artillery. And no sooner had those B-17s been lit up than the artillery lit up. And the B-17 formation began to take on heavy damage. Now, those of you that know your World War II history, you know that the B-17 was very well respected by pilots and crew alike because the B-17 had the ability to absorb immense destruction. I mean, you could shoot it full of holes, sometimes even taking off entire panels or a tail, and it would still get its crew safely home. But even a B-17 has its limits. And on one of the B-17s there, where this crew was terrified now at the prospect of what was developing, the plane had fires that were beginning, one of the fuel tanks exploded, and it was very clear that this plane was not going to make it back home. The command came from the flight deck to abandon ship, bail out, get your chute, let's leave. Immediately, the crew sprang into action. One by one, they grabbed their chutes, jumped out the side of the stricken plane, But when it came to the last crew member, he went to reach for his chute, and there wasn't one. Now, in the chaos of war, who knew what had happened? Perhaps it had been blown out somehow by one of the shells that had struck the planes. Maybe somebody had forgotten to stock the B-17 for the number of crew that were actually going to be on it. But at that particular moment, whatever the case was, there was no shoot, and this young man had to make a decision. Would he ride the plane down to the ground and hope that it would crash in such a way that he would survive? And then would he survive, doing the calculus in his brain, the onslaught of the enemy that would undoubtedly be tracking his plane to the ground? Or option B. Should he jump out of the side of the plane into the dark night without a parachute? And in what probably seemed like an eternity, but really only took a few fractions of a second, he chose option B. And he went to the door, and he jumped out into the darkness. The story doesn't tell us what he thought on the way down. We can only speculate. You know, many people that have been faced with life-threatening situations like that, their life flashes before their eyes. If you've ever had one of those, you know this could actually happen. Maybe family and friends from back home, things in the past, the good times, etc., the things that he would now not be able to do in the future. Perhaps all of that was passing through his mind. We don't know, but we do know this. After just a few seconds, he ran into something. Now, it wasn't a very hard hit, but instinct took over, and whatever it was, he wrapped his arms around it. And to his great surprise, whatever it was, wrapped its arms around him. And a moment later, 
there came this hard tug, not downward or sideways, but blessedly upward, and the sound of an unfurling parachute hit his ears. You see, what had happened was this. The crewman before him that jumped out with a parachute knew that he should not pull his parachute right away, even though by this time they're only three or 4,000 feet above the ground, because if the chute had been popped immediately, the spotlights would have seen it. And as had happened to many a soldier parachuting down to the ground, he would probably have been hit either by artillery or by enemy planes that could now see him very, very clearly. And so that second to last crewman had waited and free fall just as long as he possibly could and then had pulled his chute and it was just enough time for the last crewman to fall through the darkness far enough that they met and the parachute carried them safely to the ground. Eventually they made it safely out of enemy territory and I cannot help but think that whenever it was that the first Thanksgiving that crewman was able to celebrate with his family and friends. Perhaps it was after the war. Maybe he was sent home. We don't know. But I can't help but think that at that first Thanksgiving, if there was anyone in the room who deserved to feel grateful, it was that young man. And that's how it's supposed to work, isn't it? I mean, isn't that how gratitude functions? Something good happens to us. Uh, maybe somebody you know, sends you a nice gift that you weren't expecting. Oh, thank you. Thank you for giving that to me. Uh, maybe you have been driving here on a, on a Friday afternoon in the greater Berrien Springs metropolitan area, and you have met with the horrific traffic that sometime is there, and maybe somebody held back just a little so that you could get into line on the road. Thank you, thank you, you'd wave, you know. Whatever it is, we experience positive results, something someone has done for us, or perhaps we experience less negative results than we had expected, and we are consequently grateful, usually without even thinking about it. And so, the gratitude computation is clear. Good stuff first, gratitude second. That's how the Thanksgiving math is supposed to work, isn't it? In fact, if it doesn't work that way, we tend to get a little perturbed, don't we? You know, even Jesus experienced this a little bit. We're not going to look there right now, but if we were to take the time and look in Luke 17, we would find the story of 10 lepers. They call from afar off. Jesus, you know, have mercy on us. Uh, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest, and on the way, all 10 of them are healed, but only one comes back to say thank you. And even Jesus says, wait a second, we're not all ten healed, but there's only one. And certainly being grateful after marvelous or even merely good things have happened to us is a very good practice for all people, and we should cultivate it well. And, and, I can't help but wonder if there is not an even better formula, a better way to be grateful, a better way to express our thanks, one that can fit us that much more for God's kingdom. A single text for you this morning, Job chapter 1, verse 13, please. Job chapter 1, verse 13, it's page 346 in most of the few Bibles that are here in the sanctuary today, page 346, Job chapter 1 beginning with verse 13. Now, a little background here to the story. Most scholars will, will agree that Job is probably the oldest book in the Old Testament, possibly written by Moses. Regardless of who the author was, it undoubtedly deals with some of the most profound issues that face humanity. I mean, you can read the book of Job over and over again, and you will still be plumbing new depths here. So powerful is the inspiration of God in His Word. Now, the story to this point, we're going to join in verse 13. If we were to read before that, we would find that God and Satan have been talking, and Satan has a complaint. There's this guy named Job who follows God faithfully, but Satan says the only reason that he follows you faithfully is because you give him good stuff. And God and he have a conversation. There's a series of events take place. The devil is not making the headway with Job that he wanted to, and so he said, okay, 
God, you've got to give me free reign in Job's life. And God says, okay, but you can't kill him. Anything else, have that. And the devil is absolutely certain that given the right time and circumstances, Job will curse God. And that's where we join the story. Job chapter 1, verse 13. Now there was a day when his, meaning Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young men, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. (laughs) Of all the things that we would expect, someone who has just lost, not just herds and, and servants, but even his own family, has now been taken from him all in the space of a few seconds. He receives this news. Of all the things we would expect him to say, this is not even remotely on the list. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Praise be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That sounds suspiciously like gratitude. And as we struggle to figure out, well, how how could this be happening? How could these words be coming from Job? It's tempting to dismiss it at first as as a response perhaps from shock or or maybe just the, the overwhelming grief and he doesn't know what else to say. But there's a problem with that guess. You see, the rest of the book of Job, if we were to read it, makes it clear that Job has no problem speaking openly and honestly with integrity even in the face of profound loss In fact, so clear is the example in Job, in the book of Job, that the conclusion to me is inescapable. Job really meant it. When he said those words, he actually meant it. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And suddenly, in the space of a single sentence, Job manages to sweep away all of the pretense that so often manages to pass as, quote, gratitude. Gratitude that only comes in response to the right stimulus. Gratitude that springs only from favorable conditions. Gratitude that seeks its own gratification just as much or even more than anyone else's. Job takes the usual thanksgiving math and he morphs it into something rarely seen today. A formula for giving thanks, even when the only things to be thankful for are that God is, and that come hell or high water, we can trust Him to do what is good and just and right. Make no mistake, this is thankfulness at its most defiant. This is thankfulness that puts a finger in the eye of fate. This is thankfulness in its unsurpassed purity. And of course, therein lies the challenge. This holiday season, please, give thanks for all the good things 
that others, and particularly God, have done for you. By all means, let us be grateful in the rearview mirror. There's nothing wrong with that. If someone has done something nice for you this week or this month or this year, let them know, particularly at this season. Let, let, let them know how grateful you are and tell God thank you, thank you, thank you for the many things that he has already done. Please do those things. And also, take up the challenge that Job so clearly gives to us. Let us also give thanks when it doesn't compute. That is, even in the midst of the pain, not for the pain, but in the midst of the pain. Let us give thanks even in a world that is increasingly at war, even when we receive bad news multiplied upon bad news from the international and national stages. Let us give thanks even in the midst of the struggles that may be plaguing you at home or in other relationships, with finances, at school, at work, even when from a human perspective there seems to be no good reason to give thanks. Let us give thanks even then, simply because we know that as Job did, that God is still God and we are still his children. Because we know that whatever he decides to do or not do, that will ultimately be what is best for us. And because of that, we know, we know that sooner or later, we will be okay. It's the new math of gratitude. And with that new math, whether we have just jumped out of a burning airplane, or like Job, seems we have lost all that is dear to us, or even if we are sitting here in the comfort of a sanctuary, we can show the world that Jesus really does make a difference. That entitlement isn't a part of the Christian's essential virtues, and that God can be trusted even when gratitude does not compute. May God's peace be with us, and may the Lord find us truly grateful this holiday season. Before you go, let me take just a moment to share with you an opportunity to get into the Bible in a fresh, new way. All across the world, more and more people are hearing the call to examine the Scriptures for themselves. If you felt drawn to learn more about God's Word, but you don't know where to start, or you're just looking for a more in-depth examination of Bible truths, then I have something right here that I believe you're going to enjoy. I would like to send you a series of Bible study guides. Each of these study guides asks and answers very important questions, such as these examples right here. Why does God allow suffering? Can God be trusted? Each of the initial five guides begins with a story to introduce the subject. Then, through a series of focused questions, you'll soon be learning portions of the Bible you may never have known before. And when you're through, you'll be able to share with others these inspiring truths from God's Word. Just call our toll-free number. It's on your screen now. 877, the two words, His Will. Friendly operators are standing by to send you these guides. Once again, that's 877, His Will. Call that number, and don't forget, to join me next week right here at this same time.